you guys that uh, may not know the backstory of what God's been doing here at Grace Church of Ocala. Years ago, uh, the church came to Sebring, uh, which is the body that we're a part of um, down in Highlands County, and the church asked if we could assist in what was happening here. Uh, they had had some interim pastors, and they were looking for someone to help out with pulpit supply. So um, in Grace Church of Sebring, there's a lot of, uh, up, you know, kind of younger, uh, being taught through GCBI, uh, people that are learning how to teach God's Word. So the opportunity presented itself when I was doing youth ministry. So we started bringing up some of the youth guys up here every Sunday. And it was a great time for those of you guys who were around for that. We got to see a lot of young guys really mature in their walk with God and be able to be involved in ministry and do ministry with an active body. Probably my favorite thing about that entire time, though, was the two and a half hour trips with three, sometimes four, don't worry, they always had a seatbelt, groups of teenage guys because the car smelled, but it was fun. You want to have some in, you know, absolutely intentional conversations, you lock them in a car for two and a half hours. And then they know that they're going to be in a car for another two and a half hours on the way home. We did that for years. And we got to see a lot of maturity come through those guys. And that's what today's sermon is about. That's what God's word is about. This idea of intentionally involving yourselves with the lives of his people and then that spreading out into intentionally involving yourself in the lives of people that are not yet God's people. The key principle this morning is that the most effective strategy in spirit-led mission is spirit-led relationship. You're going to hear the word relationship about 87 times this morning. And if I say it 88 times, it's not too many. How are we doing with our relationships outside of the body? We are called by God to come together as a group here. We, we were bound by Him. His Holy Spirit has bound us together. But how are we doing with reaching our community? And I want to propose an idea that reaching our community means actually interacting with them, sometimes for years before you get the opportunity for that to happen. So we read through, we're going to be covering two chapters today. So we read through chapter 19, and we're going to um, finish up in chapter 20, but we want to go ahead and bring it back to the last time on Acts, right? So you see this pattern being developed in, in this missionary journeys through Paul. Paul goes into a town, preaches, teaches, lives there with the people. Um, sometimes people come to know the Lord, sometimes they don't, but then it always seems like it ends in people wanting to kill him. It's kind of a theme over and over and over again, and he gets kicked out of town. He ends up running away through different riots and things that you see. And that played itself out in these last few chapters. You also see that Paul was dealing with all kinds of problems on different fronts right now. This is an incredibly important time in his ministry. He was dealing with uh, new converts, how to mature those new converts, and dealing with people twisting the gospel to fit what they wanted. Because Paul and his team would come into a town and they would interact with those people. They'd spend months there, years there sometimes. And then after they would leave, guess what would happen? a group of people would come in and try to pervert the gospel and make it about themselves. So he's writing these letters, interacting with people, and constantly focusing on kingdom work, what God was doing. Being hit from all sides, seemingly. You want to follow God, do ministry. Because he will make you follow him because it gets incredibly hard. It gets incredibly difficult when you're doing God's work. Because the world that we live in fights that. If you want to live a life for Christ, you want to walk with Christ, you will stand out. And when you stand out, it's easier to be picked at and pulled at. That's what it's about, though. That's what we're called to do. There's encouragement in that. And you saw the... Did we see that a riot broke out here? We're going to get more in depth here, but did everybody see the riot? Have any of us ever been in a riot? No? I've never been in a riot. I mean, I would assume that that's pretty crazy stuff. They shouted out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours? I'd say that's, that's pretty, pretty direct and pretty aggressive, right? So let's unpack chapter 19 and then we'll move on from there. This first section I, I titled, Coaching Them Up. So what you see is that Paul is going through this pattern. and it's, It says there at the beginning of 19, did everybody see it said he found some disciples? Remember when we read that? I know it was a little bit earlier this morning, but when I hear found some disciples, I think, oh, okay, um, 
I, I found some disciples, like I, I found some change on the ground. Does that sound silly to you? Because I've never found a disciple. I've had disciples, but I never found them. I never just walked around and like, oh look, there's some disciples there. There's some people that are willing to follow me and following Christ. The Greek there, the translation, is, is finding after searching intently. There's something that we miss if we just skip right past that. Because Paul went into this town and he looked for people that wanted to follow God. He proclaimed the word of God to them. And then when they did, he asked them questions and interacted with them. Do we remember what they said at the beginning of this chapter? Did they know about the Holy Spirit? No. Well, how, how did they respond when Paul said, you know, do you, do you have the Holy Spirit? They didn't know about the Holy Spirit. They were missing part of you know, God's truth. The, these are people, think of the people in your life right now where you ask them if they're a follower of Christ and they say, yeah, I know who Jesus is and nothing else. They have no background in, in what God's word says. They don't live a life for Christ. They just heard the story. Well, these people had heard about a baptism through John. The Holy Spirit wasn't even a part of it. So in his interacting with them, he realized that something was missing, that they didn't know Christ. So Paul doesn't stop there. So he led them to Christ, and he took them to the synagogues to minister. Did you see that? So Paul's interacting with these people. He says, hey, do you know who Jesus is? Well, uh, yeah, we, we, we heard about John. We got baptized in the baptism of John. Remember, John was talking about before Jesus came, he was baptizing repentance. You guys, you guys remember that story, right? So when that's happening, the Holy Spirit has not shown up. So Paul's like, well, we're... We're missing something here. So instead of leaving them in the place they were without all of the truth, he lived with them. He interacted with them. He taught them. And then they came to know the Lord, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them, and then he didn't stop there. He didn't just, all right, see you guys later. He took them into the synagogues and ministered in front of them. They did it together. That's what ministry is about. And then when things got crazy, he got out of Dodge. He protected them. So here are our truths from this section. Leading people requires investing in people. Believer, you must invest in the community in which God has placed you. Or why would they care? They don't care what we have to say. Many people don't even care what God has to say. But when you interact with them, when you live life with them, you then gain the right to speak into their lives. And Paul did. He invested in these guys. And modeling ministry is a part of the ministry model. He didn't leave them there. He led them to Christ, then ministered in front of them, and then allowed them to do ministry too. How's that model look in your life? Have, are, are you leading people to Christ? Is, is, are, are you being faithful in following him? And are you a part of ministering to God's people? Are you a part of going out into your community? Are you modeling what God is doing in your life to someone else? Or are we missing the beginning of it? Where are you at? Check that. Figure out where, where you're at right now. The Holy Spirit is doing work. He's, he's articulating to you right now. What is it you're doing? What have I called you to do? And are you following me? And if you're following me, are you bringing someone along with you? Because that's what it's about. It's about modeling it for someone else. Paul was incredibly intentional in everything he did. Last truth is protect those God has placed in your care. Paul was shepherding these guys. He met them, spent life with them, led them to Christ, then did ministry in front of them, you helped them in their ministry themselves. And then when it was time to pull them out because they were going to be beaten, he protected them. You know what all that involves? And continuously investing time. Our lives are God's. And he's using them to reach our communities. By again, interacting with people. Can, I, can we say interacting with people on the count of three? You guys ready? One, two, three. Now, can we say it like we want to do it? Ready? One, two, three. We got to do it. And guess what? 
Some people are pretty interesting. It can be fun. We can actually, we can, we can go to lunch with people. We can have time, we can spend time intentionally not doing what we want, how we want. We can meet them where they are. Because Paul got on a boat and went to their place. They didn't come to his. He went to where God called him to be, their community, embedded himself within that community, led these people to Christ, then brought them along in ministry, modeled it for them, and then protected them. It's like the whole model is right here. It's right there in just a few verses. But it doesn't end there. It continues in these last verses of chapter 19. It gets very combustible. Because you know what happens when you follow God? Attacks will happen. So you have people were seeing God and they were seeing him through miracles and healings. Some people tried to make it about themselves, not about what God was doing. Did you see the exorcist? Guys, we just read about exorcists. These guys were going in and they were trying to pronounce demons out of people. They were trying to do the spiritual warfare thing and they were doing it using the name of Christ, but without the relationship with Christ. It was about pulling God's power, but not actually involving yourself with the God of the universe. I'm going to shout Jesus at something and expect that to have power when I don't believe that Jesus is anything. Does that sound ridiculous? We do it too. Gee, but, but everything in our own lives is so bent around, I, you know, I don't, my life really doesn't look at all like I follow Jesus. But Jesus, and then nothing happens. <laughs> and people sit back and wonder why that is. But you know how big God is? That when that stuff happened, God used the work of the enemy in that situation to further his gospel. Did you see that? So these guys go out. They try to pronounce these demons out of, this, of these bodies. They run away naked and scared. They almost get killed is what it says. And then you would think, okay, if it's about God's name, how's this going to go? Because this looks like Jesus doesn't have power. But then God uses it to save all sorts of other people that are practicing the same uh, magical stuff. And then they burn their books. They realize the power of who God is in an attack. That's how powerful the God we serve is. In an attack from the enemy, he still brings glory to himself. And then Demetrius talks to a few people, which becomes a riot throughout Ephesus. Now, a couple quick things to notice with that. Did, did you see in the Temple of Artemis, right? The whole idea behind that, they had an entire economy built around this. This was the tourist destination. This was the Grand Canyon. Okay, people made little figurines, they sold stuff in the marketplace. You went to the Temple of Artemis, wonder of the ancient world type stuff, and you could go and you could see Artemis. This entire town was built around it. And notice Demetrius goes to the people and his first point isn't that this is a God. His first point is, guys, we make money off this. Paul is talking about gods being made by hand or not gods. Did anyone laugh when that was on the screen? Seriously, you could totally like raise your hand because I thought that was hilarious. Paul said to them, gods made by hand are not gods, a message that you see over and over and over again throughout all of the prophets. And then Demetrius', Demetrius his response to that isn't, yeah, a God made by me is not a God. His response is, Paul said that. How out of touch are they? How out of touch are we? How are you doing with idols? How are you doing with the things that you're creating with your own hands? or you're following with your heart that you're making more important than God. Where you at? It's big deal stuff. Because when God comes in and he declares his word, sometimes we shout right back, yeah, but this is mine. This is how I make my money. And then did you notice that when they didn't respond to that, then he went pious. Then he went to the religion stuff. The second point was then, oh, but it's, no, 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 Artemis is, is magnificent, right? Then he got the crowd. 
And then they're shouting and they're, they're starting a riot. They're, everyone's coming together and they're shouting out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! How you want to be on that missionary journey? You want to be in the middle of that jungle when everyone starts to shout out about the pagan idol that they've created that you've come in and talked about who God is? How about your workplace? You want to be the one in your workplace who says who God is? Because they can shout just as loud. And it can be just as intimidating. And sometimes the shouts are through looks, through isolation. I work in a secular workplace. I know what it's like. You guys do too. But that's the community God placed you in. That's where he's called you to be. He's called you to live life with these people. To interact with them. To show them that you actually care. And in doing that, sometimes it ends really badly. There's attacks that happen. So our truths from this section are whenever people are coming to Christ, the enemy will attack. Expect that. Do not be ignorant of that. Grace Church, hear that. People have come to Christ within this body and we have been attacked. That has happened and it will continue to happen as long as we are following God. It's an expectation. God will use everything for His glory, including those attacks. And then the third point, the attack may escalate, but remember truth too. You see it? When the escalation happens, because it will happen, it went from being, oh, you know, this, this, this is this whole exorcist thing and all these people shouting and running off and then the attack and then God proclaimed himself strong and then all these people came to know who Christ was and then in that it was like, oh, okay, now things are good, we see what God's doing and then an attack came right after. Don't be ignorant of this. The God we serve has declared it in his word that it will happen and it could get so much to the extent that this is like, we showed the image before a few weeks ago. Remember like the scene from the old Frankenstein movies of the people coming with pitchforks and stuff? It's not that far off. But even in those escalated attacks, he'll show himself strong there too. That's the God we serve. I love it. I absolutely love it. And you know who's watching all of that? Those disciples that Paul found. They were involved in every bit of it. And some of the disciples that Paul found on the first couple of missionary journeys, they were aware of it too. And Paul was using it for encouragement, which we're going to see here in chapter 20. So that's a lot of words. Let's read Acts chapter 20. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece, where he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and the stand of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Syndicus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days came to them at Troas, where he stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus sat at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive were not, and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the last ship, we set sail for Asos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for he had arranged intending himself to go by land. And when we met up at Asos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came to the following day to opposite Chios. The next day we touched down at Samos, and the day after that we went on to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus. 
so that he might, have, might not have more time to spend in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they had came to him, he said, You yourselves know that I lived among you for the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and the Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city what will happen to me there. Oh, except, oh, excuse me, verse 23. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life to any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you, this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I do not shrink from the declaring of you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure forces, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, being sorrowful, most, uh, most of all because of the word he had spoken, that he would not see their face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. What you see over and over and over again in Paul's life is this intentionality. Let's get a little bit more in depth with it. Intentional is an action performed with awareness, done deliberately, consciously, on purpose. How intentional are we? Think through your day. What intentional steps are you taking to follow Christ? What intentional steps are you taking to meet your own needs? Where's the balance with that? How are you doing with that? I think many would argue that through the evidence that we have in Paul's life, now he was just a man, but this guy was incredibly intentional. He gave his entire life to the ministry that God had called him to. So we have in this chapter, after the riot, Paul used it to encourage his team. Because remember, his team was right there for the entire thing. He continued his encouragement tour with the team God had given him. You see over and over again in Acts, after something happens... Uh, Paul will then leave that, that situation, he'll move on to a new area, and he'll, he will use what God has taught him throughout this in the new place that he is, and he'll encourage the people there, because he's preparing them for when he will now, no longer be there. And you see that at the end of this chapter. A young man was healed after falling out of Paul's sermon. Did you guys check that? Is that anyone like, really? The guy fell asleep and three stories down? This is like, I mean, obviously the guy died, so I'm not trying to trivialize it, but he lives, so we can. Is that a little Bible humor? Like, you feel like, you know, maybe Paul's, you know, or Luke, as he's writing this, is taking a shot at people that fall asleep when Paul's preaching? I'm just kidding, you were supposed to laugh at that. But that's the idea, right? This, this guy's literally hearing Paul preach, and Paul preaches till midnight, falls asleep, and then falls three stories down and dies. And Paul, I'll be right back, heals the guy, comes back and says, all right, second point. Is that not great? Right? I love that story. It's awesome. You'll see why that's so important here in a moment. Paul then called the Ephesian elders for a final interaction. So the truths from this 
our exhortation is an essential part of the body. It's an essential role. When I say exhortation, what pops into your head? Anybody? Loud and proud. Encouragement, praise. Encouragement, praise, okay. How encouraging are you to the body God's called you to be a part of? Are you encouraging that body? Hopefully you are. If you're not, God has equipped certain ones of us with the spiritual gift of encouragement more so than others. But guess what? We can all be encouragers. You can all encourage the body. And Paul understood that because guess what? It was really hard to follow Christ right then. Imagine having to follow Christ when it meant you could be killed. We're coming up on Roman stuff where people are going to be literally lit on fire for torches. It's about to get really hard to follow Christ. And he's going through this area and encouraging all these people. And in doing it is bringing his team along. Because it's not just about the ministry Paul's doing. It's about the ministry they will continue to do when Paul's gone. Remember, the model of ministry is modeling ministry. It's what he was doing. You also see that the end goal of a spirit-led relationship is to point people to the truth. That's the intentionality part. When we talk about interacting with the lives of the people that God has called you to interact with, the intentional part of that is knowing I'm going to spend time with you doing what you want to do. I'm going to pour into your life, but I'm doing it with the purpose of proclaiming truth to you. I'm doing it because at some point I hope that God has been working on your heart and he has equipped me to help in your salvation and help proclaiming the gospel to these folks. And that's what they were doing. They were going through interacting with these people. So Paul goes through, he sits down with this group, and he's going to preach. And as he's preaching, we talked about the young man falling out. Notice that miracles are a vehicle to point to truth. The guy died, and we talked about that. But the big point of that is that Paul went down and healed him. And you know what that did? That probably got everybody's attention at midnight. You think? I doubt he was the only one who was thinking, all right, Paul, might want to wrap it up. Let's get to the end of this sermon. Where, what's, your, what's your closing point? Let's, let's get this going. I, I got work in the morning. But then when the guy falls out of the third story window, dies and Paul heals him, we might be on the edge of our seat at that point, right? Right? I don't know about you guys. I would. That would wake me right up. Because I don't want to be the guy who falls. And then Paul says, no, we were only healing one tonight. You can laugh at that one. Thank you. I appreciate it. But seriously, but, but here's what God does. Because here's the thing. It's really easy to leave it in that room, in that time frame. God allows miracles. God does miracles now, but he does it so that we can point people to truth. He doesn't just heal people to heal people. He heals them so that he can proclaim who he is to them to make it real. Because sometimes people need a jolt. When's the last time you were in a situation that was just absolutely a God moment? And you, you knew you had that urge, okay, this is the moment when I need to talk to this person about who God is. Because God's doing something in their, in their life. He's moving something in their heart. You can see what's happening, but you're, okay. Are you prepared to give an account for the hope that you have? What are we doing? Because the point of the miracle is to point them to him. Paul saw that. He healed him and then went right back to preaching God's word. He knew he only had a short time with him. Grace Church, we only have a short time with the community that we are a part of. Very short time. Our lives are over like that. I'm 31 and yesterday I was like 10. I don't understand how I got to 31 so quickly. Seriously, you guys are laughing because you understand exactly what I'm talking about. I was, well, last, last week when we were doing the Chilling Girl, I was sitting out there at the campfire, and I went, yeah, I'm 30. I was like, no, I'm 31. That was a whole year in there that, all right. It happens fast. And it's happening fast for the people that do not know him as well. How intentional are we? Last section. Being an illustration yourself is a very powerful thing. Paul hearkens them back to remember me walking with you. 
Remember the time I spent with you, the three years I spent with you? He says, I served with you with humility, through tears, and through trials. It's really easy to come alongside somebody when everything's hunky-dory. It's really hard to be with somebody in the hard time. Paul's saying, I served with you. I lived with you. Humbly. I didn't come into town telling you, you need to know this. I didn't slap you in the face with God's word. I lived life with you. And then in tears, I served with you. I encouraged you. And through the trials of your life, I was there. How many of us are in the trials of lives of people that do not know Jesus? Where are we at with that? Are you interacting with the world that God is redeeming? Because he's doing work. He's invited us to be co-laborers in that work. Next thing you see is, in spirit-led relationship, sharing burdens encourages both parties. Paul knows what's going to happen. He says that the Holy Spirit has declared to him that in his going to Jerusalem and on to Rome, it's not going to be pretty. He didn't go to Ephesus, if you see what's there. What he did do, though, was he called for the Ephesian elders. He called them in, and they got on a boat, and they went out to Miletus, where he was. You know why they did that? Because he went to them. He interacted with them. He loved them. And now they know who Christ is. And now they're called by their discipler to come. And this is a two-party thing here, guys. Paul is calling them because he knows what's happening for him. And you know what? We can't make Paul a superman. It was hard to know that that was coming. So he calls these guys in. They come in and he shares what's about to happen with them. Two trains of thought here. Focus. Not only is he encouraging them in saying, I know what's about to happen because God has declared it to me and it's okay. But they're also encouraging him in that they went and they interacted with him in his time of a trial, of tears, of heartbreak. He knows what he's walking into. And both of them, both these two parties are encouraging each other. Remember we talked about exhortation being an essential role of the body? That's the body working right there in Scripture. The body coming together around Paul, knowing what Paul's about to go through, and sharing the burden. Grace, how are we doing with that? How are you doing with sharing the burden with one another? Are we coming in and are we leaving immediately? Or are we actually interacting with people? Are we actually asking what's going on in our lives? When we provide that time, the point of that time is to interact with one another, to pray with one another, to find out what's going on in each other's lives. Now, we're a small body. We're a small body. We got to get that now. Because if God chooses to grow this body, it's a lot harder when there's a lot more people to then start being intentional about relationships. We need to be intentional about it now. That's what he's called us to. And then finally, clear communication of responsibility leads to effective ministry. This is the closing of this chapter. So Paul then explains to them, here's your role. You are the elders of this body. You are called by God to defend them against the fierce wolves that are coming. Know that. There's no sugarcoating here. Paul doesn't say, hey, everything's awesome. You know what? I'm going to be in Jerusalem. It's going to be kind of hard for me, but we prayed, so now everything's fine. And, you know, it's going to be good. Don't worry. It's not going to be a big deal. No. He had an absolute, intentional, hard conversation with them about what it meant to follow Christ. And he pointed out that they were the ones that were equipped by God to lead that body. Paul would not be around forever. And he said, that church, that body, was paid for by the blood of Christ. No pressure. Protect that body. When the fierce wolves come, and he says some of them will come within your ranks, protect that body. Finally, in closing, that's just part of the places that Paul went. Just look at that for a second. I had to just lower the font to its absolute smallest point to even get it all on the PowerPoint. 
those are all places that Paul went and was intentional with interacting with people there. Here's some places we go. How intentional are you? Not in just being nice, but in actually building an authentic relationship with somebody. Where are you at with that? Because a spirit-led relationship, that's how you declare who God is. That's being led by the Spirit in the mission of declaring His Word to people. It's community. I put bike trails because Pastor Todd likes to ride bikes. I clearly am not a bike rider. But seriously, like, how, how are we doing with this? Some of the most effective ministry I've ever been a part of were those car rides. To this day. And it's not even close. The relationships I have with those guys now and the walks that those guys have with God and the way that he used that time and he blessed it. He did the work. He allowed me to be a part of it, but he did the work were those car rides. Intentionally spending time with those guys. How are you doing with that? That's what he's called us to. He said, love the world that I'm redeeming. Interact with them. See them for what they are, lost people. And we all were lost. How's your relationship building going? He's called you to do it. He's equipped you to do it. This is how the gospel went forth from the beginning. Why would we think now would be any different? Most effective strategy, spirit-led mission is spirit-led relationship. That's what he's called us to do. Let's get on board.